Tonight I'm going to depart a little bit from my normal Shabbat treatment of the Torah portion. Normally I'll do a three points of interest. Uh, we're going to stray away from that tonight and focus on something that's, from my point of view, incredibly important and critical as it relates to who Israel is and how the church, we, those in Messiah, should relate to Israel. So, tonight's Torah portion, of course, is Mishpatim, which really means judgments. Mishpat is to judge or judge. Um, judgments, mish, Mishpatim. So tonight's Torah portion is all about aspects of the, of the commandments, what we call the commandments, uh, the, the mitzvahot. So tonight we're going to take a different approach, like I said, to the Torah portion. Let me give you an additional Hebrew word. The word is mi'at. Who knows what that word mi'at is? Slowly, slowly, little, or slowly. Uh, it really, it really, it's really more, more, more appropriate to say slowly. But it's little. So mi'at, mi'at, we find that in tonight's Torah portion where God said to Moses that the children of Israel will enter into the land and take the land, miat miat. So let's take a read of that in Exodus chapter 23, in tonight's Torah portion, verse 30. And what was, the, what was the reason for that approach, that the children of Israel will take the land slowly, slowly? What was God's intent? And we'll, we'll, we'll discover that here in a moment. So in chapter 23 of Exodus, I'm going to read for you verse 30. We got quite a few uh, verses to read tonight in regards to what my, my major point will be. I will drive them out before you, liat, miat, miat, which again is little by little. Your Bible says little by little. The word in Hebrew is actually closer to slowly. Until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. So God's intentions... My intention concerning taking the land is that they would have taken it gradually. Miat, miat. Slowly, slowly, as they traveled northwards from where? Remember that God never intended for them initially to approach the land from the east, from Gilgal. His intent was, was of course, that they would take the land from the south, from Kadesh Barnea. As you recall, he brought them to Kadesh Barnea, and they were to enter in. Rather, what did they do? They decided to send spies in. That was not God's idea. That was the children of Israel. That was their idea. And they came back with an evil report. And for that reason, they did not take the land from the south. Slowly, slowly, they took the land from the east. And things were a bit different at that point. All right, so let's, let's talk about what I want to put emphasis on tonight. So, let's talk about Mount Sinai. Of course, we're still at Mount Sinai in the chronology of the Torah portions. We're still at Mount Sinai. What did we read about last week? What was the essence of last week's Torah portion? God wanted intimacy with Israel. He wanted them to draw near to the mountain. And they chose to stay far off. And as a result, didn't have that intimacy, didn't have that empowerment that Shavuot is really supposed to represent. Shavuot is about empowerment, a people being empowered for the purpose of ministry, for the purpose of carrying out God's work. When you look at the Feast of Shavuot, purely from an agrical point of view, what is the feast about? It's a feast, of, it's a feast about the harvest. It's a feast that basically uh, says, we're going to have bread for another year. We're going to have store, stores of flour, stores of wheat, so for the next year, we will be empowered to serve God, to live in the land and to prosper. So Shavuot is about empowerment. And this is what God had for Israel at Mount Sinai, an empowerment where they would come to that mountain and stay at the foot of the mountain. They did come to the mountain, right? And what happened? Fear overwhelmed them and they retreated. They backed away from the mountain. And Moses said, you should come to the mountain because... You don't, you don't want to sin. You don't want to live in sin, right? That's what he said. Come to the mountain so that you will not sin. Israel did not. And as a result, their, their experience 
all the way into the diaspora, 70 AD ultimately is in fact just that. No power, no intimacy with God, sin. Now there was another Shavuot that the Bible makes mention of. It's called Pentecost. That was in fact Shavuot. On that Shavuot, the church, the body of Messiah, was empowered. And the Holy Spirit came upon the church and the church was again ready for the harvest. And the harvest, of course, is what we're in right now. Jesus said the harvest is ready, but there are few being prepared for it. His disciples were prepared for it on the day of Shavuot. So, let's begin to look at this. So, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was effectively a chupa. You know what a chupa is? What is a chupa? It's effectively a tent. A tent under which a wedding occurs. And for that wedding, you have a husband and a bride and an officiator. Correct? Someone that will officiate the wedding. So, at Mount Sinai, God wanted Israel to come to that mountain, and his intentions were to betroth Israel, to be his wife. This is what God wanted at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, that, that Shavuot, was all about a betrothal, where God would take Israel to be his wife. What is a betrothal? It's not the nuptial. A betrothal is basically an announcement, or uh, what we call an engagement. So Mount Sinai was supposed to be very much an engagement. It was to be a, a prolonged process by which ultimately he would take Israel to be his wife. They come into the mountain initially was the betrothal. I believe that over the next 40 days, or at the end of the next 40 days, it was for them to be married. That marriage was to occur at Mount Sinai. It didn't. Why did that marriage not occur? Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days. And he came down from the mountain with the tablets. I want to express to you that the tablets uh, are actually what we call a ketubah. What's a ketubah? A ketubah is a contract. Well, that's not true at all. You should never refer to God's commandments as a, in a contractual uh, light. The ketubah is not a contract. The ketubah is the basis for a covenant. If you look at a, a ketubah as a contract, Contracts are made to be broken. Contracts are not what the initial ketubah at Mount Sinai was supposed to be. So there are many people that do in fact consider the mitzvot, the commandments, as a ketubah, the basis for the co a covenant between a husband and wife. Uh, let me ask a question. How many of us here, husband and wives, uh, consider yourselves in a contract? <laughs> You're not in a contract. You're in a covenant. A covenant is holy. A covenant brings life. A covenant brings redemption. And so when you consider your family, if you have children and even grandchildren and so on, you, you see the aspect of life, of redemption. And, and so a covenant brings life. And so we're not in, Israel did not enter into contract with God. Perhaps to a certain extent they saw the commandments as contractual. But that's wrong. It was very much a ketubah. You see, Israel, again, was to be his wife, and it didn't happen. It didn't occur at Mount Sinai. Now, we're going to see here in a few moments that it will, in fact, occur. There will be another opportunity for Israel to receive the ketubah. Now, after 40 days, what happened? Moses comes down with, basically, what is the ketubah? The ketubah was etched in stone. Think about that. Ketubas today are written on paper. They are ketubas that dates all the way back to 400 BC on parchment. But this ketuba that God had prepared for Israel was etched in stone. Is there some symbolism there for Israel? Well, what's the symbolism of that ketuba being etched in stone? It's everlasting. It's eternal. God could have produced parchment or paper. He could have, but he chose to write it on a rock and present it to Israel. What happened when Moses came down from the mountain with the ketubah? Israel was worshiping another god. Right in the midst of that, Israel was being a harlot. When she should have been 
completely surrender to God for that wedding at the end of that 40-day period, receiving the ketubah, she was a harlot. Of course, we know what the outcome of that was. So I, I need you to see from that light, because it's very much in that light. And I know that this is difficult for us as Christians to see, to, to, to recognize, to conceive, and to embrace. Why is it difficult, friends, for us to see this from a Christian point of view as Israel being God's betrothed? That God had fully intended, the God of Israel had fully intended to take Israel to be his wife. Why would we struggle with that concept? Anyone? And he has chosen the church to be his bride. Right. That's basically right. Replacement theology is at the epicenter of that incredible uh, rocky doctrine. And that's why I use the word epicenter. Replacement theology is a plague in Christianity. It's been plague in Christianity for 1,700 years. Some would say even further back. And it's absolutely true. How many of us are not aware of what replacement theology is? Show of hands. Don't be, don't be ashamed if you don't know what replacement theology is. Okay, replacement theology for the, for, the, for the kids who don't know basically says that we Christians who are better than Israel, we replace Israel. How do you think about that? The two, the two kids who had their hands up, how do you feel about that? That's bad, that's bad, I like that, it's bad. It's very bad. It is very bad. Replacement theology is completely in opposition to the nature of God. That God would change his mind and choose someone else. Is God faithful? Yes. yes. If he had chosen at Mount Sinai to bring Israel to himself, do you think perhaps he was taken by surprise and totally, perhaps, but don't you think that God would in fact be faithful with his intentions. His will, his intentions was in fact to bring Israel to himself and betroth Israel, that Israel will be his bride. Now there's an aspect of this that has to do with the land of Israel. God's covenant, his ketubah, is very much inclusive of the land. And we're going to see this here in a few moments. But yes, we Christians, we believe that we are better cut than the people of Israel. They're stiff-necked, they're rejected, but we are not because we're simply better, you see. Now examine that statement. Are we actually any better than Israel? Have we been more faithful? When you look at the span of Christianity over the last 2,000 years, how much better are we than the Jewish people? And I think you would come to terms with that. We, as Christians, we're fickle, we're divided, we're unbiblical. Today, today's Christianity, particularly, is so much more unbiblical than Christianity of the period when we didn't have the Bible. That's an absolute amazement. We're much more unfaithful. We, 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 have, we have no excuse because there's a Bible in everyone's house. We have many Bibles, and yet we are not standing in the Word of God. We're not upholding the Bible. We're not honoring the Bible. We use the Bible conveniently. We cherry pick. We conveniently appropriate whatever we want from the Bible. This is a shame. And this is part of the reason why we're so weak. I say we, I mean Christianity. No, God saw Israel as his wife 3,500 years ago as Mount, at Mount Sinai, his wife-to-be. And he sees Israel in the very same way today. And I can assure you of that because I'm going to read some text for you, some scripture for you from the Bible that clearly states that he intends to do it regardless of the fact that they were unfaithful at Mount Sinai. He fully intends to take Israel to be his wife. It's an amazing fact. And yet the church is blinded. So very early on in the prophets, God makes an incredible statement in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 54. We should go to Isaiah and read in Isaiah chapter 54. I'm going to read through Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. For your husband, speaking here to the people of Israel, for your husband is your maker. 
whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. Now, consider that verse. Let's back engineer that verse a little bit. The Lord of all the earth. In other words, earth is his footstool, heaven is his throne. This God, the God of Israel, he is your husband. So if you back engineer that, that verse, that's what it's saying. The God of all creation, the God of heaven and earth, the Holy One of Israel, he is your husband. And he's not speaking to the church, he's speaking directly to Israel. And it's a shame that we would take that verse and twist it and misappropriate it to ourselves. You see, we in Christ, those of us in Moshiach, we have also a husband, don't we? And that husband, in fact, is in fact Yeshua. That betrothal happened on the day of Pentecost. When will that wedding take, take place? When he breaks the eastern, the eastern sky, when he returns, he takes his bride. So, herein lies a bit of a pressure as it relates to the concept of the Trinity. It clearly denotes that Jesus is separate from the Father. Because the Father has a bride, and so does the Son. Now that might tweak your concept on the Trinity, but I'm not here to teach on the Trinity tonight. We'll do that yet again. But you see, the Son, Yeshua Jesus, has a bride. And he expects that bride to be spotless on the day of his coming. Without sin, without blemish without spot or wrinkle, and that's who we are. And that comes from the place of surrender and obedience. The church will be that vessel. What about Israel? Yes, God will bring Israel to such a place. So let's read here. So let's, I want to read Isaiah. Now we read Isaiah chapter 54 verse 5. I want to read the whole text in context. The whole block there, which is, is chapter 50, 54, 4 to 8. So we're going to read the whole thing in context. Because, you know, if you just extract verse 5, you can say, well, you didn't read it in context. So maybe that's not what it's saying. But let's read the whole thing in context. God here is speaking to Israel. He says, fear not, for you will not be put to shame. Now, if you, if you back up a little bit, you'll see very clearly in the broader context of, of the passage, he is speaking directly to Israel. And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your husband is your maker, those uh, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And the Redeemer is the Holy One, who is called the, the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsake you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with an everlasting love and kind with everlasting love and kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer, your Goel. So the Goel, the Holy One of Israel, will redeem Israel, will take Israel to be his wife. Those verses are very romantic, aren't they? They reflect God's romantic compassion towards Israel. Is the word compassion mentioned there? Absolutely. God is wooing Israel. He's saying, even though you are currently rejected, as a widow even, you're not a widow. I will bring you back. I will... I will restore you. I will take you once again to be my wife, is what he's saying to Israel. Now, there is also a connection between the people and the land. Let's go to Isaiah 62. There's a very direct correlation, connection between the people and the land. Now, the word in Hebrew for inheritance or heritage is nakala. You've heard that before. It's one of my favorite Hebrew words, nakala. There's a word that's derived from the Hebrew word nakala for a wedding, and it's nakla. So the word nakla, which is one of the common words that are used in Israel today for a wedding, 
for a nuptial comes from the Hebrew word nakala, inheritance. Throughout the Bible, in Isaiah, in the Psalms, in Joel, and in many other places in the Psalms, again, we see that Israel is God's heritage. Israel is God's nakala. But in Ezekiel chapter 36, God clearly illustrates that the land of Israel and the people of Israel together is in fact God's inheritance, his nakala. What he will e eventually marry for himself, the land and the people. In Joel chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, it states so clearly that God will enter into judgment with the nations because of his nakala, the land and the people. Very vivid. So now in Isaiah chapter 62, I'm going to read for you 4 and 5. It will no longer be said to you forsaken, nor your land will excuse me, nor to your land it will no longer be said desolate, but you will be called my delight is in her, and your land will be married, for the Lord delights in you, and to him your land will be married. You see that? God is going to take the land and the people, his heritage, and marry Israel in that land. And the land will be married to God. And the land will also be married to Israel. For as a young man marries a virgin, so, so your sons will marry you. Speaking here to the land. That's amazing. Because in, in Ezekiel chapter 36, God prophesies to the land the very same concept that the sons of Israel will return and take the land to be their inheritance, their nakala, their nakla. Your sons will marry you, and as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. So you cannot miss the significance of God's love and his desire towards Israel, the land and the people, to be his wife. So what happened at Mount Sinai? Again, we talked about this last week. Of course, Israel sort of nullified what God had intended. By doing what? By rejecting him. How did they reject him? First, the first thing they did was they backed away from the mountain. As soon as they backed away from the mountain, Moses realized that this will lead to sin. And he told them that very thing right at that time. Moses goes up the mountain, 40 days, and of course, we know what happens during that 40-day period. At some point, the people said, hey, let us worship the calf, the bull that we worshiped in Egypt. Aaron said no. They said yes. Aaron said okay. And they all brought their gold, and they handed it over to Aaron, and Aaron threw the gold in the fire, and pop, here comes the golden calf. That's what, that's what the account tells us. So Aaron is in sin. He's in sin, no doubt. What happens? They begin to worship almost immediately, I think, another god. So they had backed away from being intimate with God. God wanted intimacy. They backed away from him. And that put them in a place of susceptibility to unrighteousness. So from that, we said last week that we should always draw near to God and desire to be intimate with him, to be close to him, and express that intimacy as you worship him, both cooperatively and privately. God wants intimacy with us, and he wanted intimacy from Israel. And Israel ended up worshiping another God, again, playing the harlot. God determined then that he would set for Israel another opportunity to present to Israel a ketubah. And the, and the prophet Jeremiah gives us that wonderful picture of what God will in fact do with Israel at some point in the future. We believe that it's not far off. And that everything that we're seeing today, the hope of a millennial kingdom, which is the Shabbat millennia, king, the Shabbat millennia uh, is the hope of this incredible event. So we take, we take, correct, we take uh, creation in a very literal sense. Six days, God created. On the seventh day, he rests. Now, 
The fall occurred at some point following creation, and God determined for himself a process of redemption through which he will take six days to work out this redemption, and he will, in fact, rest on the, on the seventh day. Now, Peter tells us that a, that a thousand years is as one day to God. So in that, in that, from that standpoint, based on that statement, where are we at in terms of this process of redemption? We're almost at the end of the sixth day. You follow me? So this process of redemption that God has began is close to being complete. We don't know exactly when, but we know it's coming to an end. And what comes after this sixth day of redemption? Six millennia since creation or since the fall? The Shabbat millennia, which is redemption. That's when Jesus comes. Yeshua comes. He establishes the Father's kingdom in the earth. And we spend a thousand years rejoicing in this Sukkot, Sukkot millennia, this time of rejoicing, the seventh millennia. All right, so let's read now what Jeremiah had to say in regards to this incredible reality that we're looking at tonight, Israel being God's bride. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 31, I'm going to read for you 31 to 34. And these verses are pivotal as it relates to this incredible event that God is preparing for Israel. And in fact, he's preparing it for all the, all the world. When this wedding occurs, and it will, I want to submit to you now that the church, the bride of the Lamb herself, together with the Lamb, will officiate this wedding. Yes. The church will officiate this wedding together with Yeshua. And this wedding will have invitees. Who will be the invitees of this wedding? The righteous of the nations. The righteous of the nations will attend this wedding. And this wedding will be between God and the people of Israel. And again, Yeshua will officiate. When you look at Moses at Mount Sinai, he's a type of Messiah. Is that true? He is a foretype of Messiah. He was to officiate at Mount Sinai. And so, when this wedding re does in fact occur, he, well not he, but Messiah, who Moses is a type of, will in fact officiate that wedding. And we are in Messiah, aren't we? So along with Messiah, we will in fact officiate that wedding. Let's read here what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new ketubah, not a contract, a new ketubah with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Not like the ketubah which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My ketubah which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. God is saying here, my intent was to be a husband to Israel. I had a ketubah prepared, but they broke it. They broke it right away. Within that 40-day period, they broke the ketubah. Even though he, had been pre he was prepared to be a husband to them. But this is the ketubah which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will put my ketubah. My ketubah, he's saying. My law within them. And on their hearts I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will be their husband, and they will be my wife. When I put my ketubah in them. You see, there's coming a time when God's going to do something incredibly profound with the people of Israel. This does not happen without a baptism of the Holy Spirit, folks. Remember what happened on the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, with the church. The Holy Spirit was a very important part of that union, wasn't it? And this is what God intended for Israel at Mount Sinai, that that union would be solidified or sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit as they would receive the Holy Spirit. It is the only way that you can have God's law, that ketubah, written on your hearts. I am obedient to Yeshua 
as part of the bride. Why? Because he has given me his Holy Spirit so that I can overcome sin and I would be empowered to keep his ketubah. And as a result, be married to him. And this is what God is preparing for all of Israel. By the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the entire nation of Israel will be able to fulfill the ketubah, to embrace it and to be obedient to it. They didn't receive it at Mount Sinai because they backed away. They didn't only back away, but they went off and worshipped the bull of Egypt. <laughs> God is saying, I will put... We'll see this here in a few moments. We're going to go to Ezekiel and, and verify this. God is going to put his Holy Spirit within the entire nation of Israel, and they will all obey him and love him and fulfill his will concerning this ketubah. Let's read. But this is the covenant which I will make. We read that. I will, let's, let's read it again. I will make... I, oh, no, no, no. Verse 33. I didn't read that. But this is the covenant which I will make. But I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and upon their hearts I will write it and I will be their God and they will be my people. We did read it. Let's read verse 34. It's all good. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. Now the word there, know, is what in Hebrew? Judea. It's the same word that's used when a man knows his wife. Judea. You see? They will all Judea him. Why? Because he would take them to be his wife. He will consummate this intimacy with Israel when he puts his Holy Spirit in them and writes his law, that ketubah, on their hearts. For they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. Their unfaithfulness to him, he will cover them. He will, he will atone, they will atone for their unrighteousness and he will take them to be his wife. Like a man that takes a woman and she knows him. He gives her his promise, the ketubah. Now, I want to I go over to Ezekiel chapter 36. We made mention of it. We should go read in it. In Ezekiel chapter 36, now what we're going to see here is part of that process of him becoming their husband and they becoming his wife has to do with, of course, him putting his law within them. But by what means? By giving them the Holy Spirit. By putting his Holy Spirit within them. I want to read for you. I'm going to read for you chapter 36. I'm going to read 24 to 28. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Who, who, who scattered them? God did. God said in, in Jeremiah, he said, the one who scattered Israel will regather Israel. And what we're seeing here is he's bringing them back for a very special, special event for this wedding. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Now the word spirit there is in common case S. He's not referring to the Holy Spirit. He's referring to a new spirit within the people of Israel. He's going to change their hearts. You know what David said to, to God in, in Psalm 51? Renew in me a right spirit and a clean heart. This is what God's going to do for all of Israel. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Then I will put my spirit. You see that? He's now referring to his Holy Spirit. Then I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You need to see this. And cause you to keep my ketubah. It only happens as they receive his Holy Spirit. Yes, all of Israel will have a Pentecostal experience, a Shavuot experience. And the people will receive his spirit. And they will obey his law. He will write the law on their hearts. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my 
wife, my people, and I will be your husband, your God. You see that. He's very vivid in Jeremiah chapter 31, and he's very vivid here. What's wonderful about what Ezekiel gives us is that the reality of the Holy Spirit is absolutely involved. It happens as the entire nation of Israel receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's going to happen. Now that, of course, is found nowhere in Christian doctrine. Where, where, where have you heard this before? Why have you not heard this before? Because these verses has been reappropriated to us. We like them, so we just took them for ourselves. We own them. It has nothing to do with the people of Israel. And that's why you don't hear about this in Christianity. But I'm saying to you, God is doing this, and he's not far away from its fulfillment. Again, we're coming to an end of the sixth day of redemption. We're, we're at the threshold, perhaps, even at the threshold of the seventh day, which is that Shabbat, that millennial Shabbat. And that's enough for us to be really excited about. Because I'm telling you, redemption is at hand. And what did Jesus say when, when you see this redemption at hand? He said what? Look up. Redemption is at hand. The goel is at hand. And that's where we are. We should be overflowing with excitement. We should be incredibly fired up and filled with zeal and filled with, 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 with hope and excitement. We shouldn't be bickering over foolish things like COVID. We should be on fire for the reality of the time that we live in. We live in a time that's, that the prophets would have given anything to see. The apostles would have, would have done anything to live in these times. And God has blessed you to be present, to see this. And we may very well see the fullness of the redemption. Praise God. The signs of it are clear all around us. Now for millennia, you've heard about the coming of Messiah. Israel expected him from 586 onward. He didn't come following 586. 70 AD, he didn't come from their point of view. But he did come. He came to be the suffering servant and to provide the way by which he would return the lion of the tribe of Judah, Moshiach ben David. He came as the suffering servant, Moshiach ben Yosef. He's about to, re to, to reappear as Moshiach ben David. And we should be downright excited about this. We should be proclaiming this. We should be addressing our Christian friends. We should be telling them to wake up. This is not the time to be asleep. This is not the time to be hoping for a better president or a better economy. This is not that time. We live in a time that transcends anything that should concern us at this time. This is the time of redemption. The hour is near. God's prepared, he's prepared already a new ketubah. With that ketubah for Israel, he's going to pour out his Ruach Kodesh, his Holy Spirit, deep within the nation of Israel. And they will all be transformed. They will all be born again. Just as Jacob was born again at the Jabbok and transformed forever. Today, Yaakov, the people of Yaakov, is about to become Israel, a prince with God. And they will all be transformed, all of them. And you, each of us in Messiah, we have a very important role in this process. You see, we are the messengers of this great thing. We are the messengers of the redemption. God has anointed us to be that voice in the midst of Israel that will bring hope. Only we can do it. No one else is appointed for this. 
You, we've talked about this many times. For some of you, you've never heard what I'm about to tell you. The story of Jacob at the Jabbok. Of course, most of you, you know the story. It's an analogous picture of what Israel is about to experience. Jacob, before that moment, that night before he, he descended into that valley, the Jordan Valley, the night before he encountered the angels at Mahanaim. You know the story, right? Genesis chapter 38. You know the story. He encountered the messengers of God at Mahanaim. And right after this encounter, what does he do? He begins to pray for the first time in a deep, fervent way. He cries out to God. He appeals to God for, for salvation and deliverance. And God brings salvation. That very night, in the morning, God brings this incredible salvation. Did Jacob have to struggle for it? Yes, he did. Did Jacob want to run, head east or south? Yes. But he fought, he struggled, and he overcame. You see, that's exactly where Israel is today. And I am suspicious that we're in the middle of that fight right now. We're in the middle, in an allegorical sense, we're in the middle of that fight right now. Jacob needs to hear from the angels. And you are God's messengers. Don't you know that that's what an angel is? We're not talking about seraphim and cherubim. We sang about them tonight. We're not talking about angelic beings who appear and disappear. We're talking about God's messengers in the earth today. That's who you're supposed to be. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, verse 7 and 8, For I say to you that Messiah, the body of Messiah, has become a servant to Israel. For what purpose? To confirm to them the promises given to the fathers. How do you do this? You do this with your words. You do this by message. You are, an, you are a melach. You are melachim. You are angels in that sense. God has appointed you. He has anointed you to speak hope and life and encouragement to Israel. Not to be Messianic Jews. Not to be random Christians. Christians. But be to, to be the people who would encourage Israel like no one else can. You are appointed for that reason. And only you can do it. Now, will all of Christianity step up to the plate? Would all of Christianity suddenly reform and come to that understanding and embrace it? No. There will be a remnant. There will be a very important remnant that will take that position, that will do away with all of the trappings, the things that traps us, Messianicism, Two-Houseism, you know, Hebraic Ruthism. It's a shame that we allow ourselves to be distracted with this. Do you know what the Hebraic root people are now saying? They are now ten seven truthers. You know, you know what ten seven truthers are? You haven't heard of the nine eleven truthers? You know what they are? They are people that believe and are convinced that nine eleven was an inside job. Many of the Hebraic root people right now. Even some of the Messianic people and the two house people are taking the position that 10 7 was an inside job. That Israel brought this upon themselves. That's what you call a blood label. That's slanderous. And that's horrible. And that's coming from the Hebraic root crowd. Yes. How could they end up in such a place? Let me, let, me, let me say something here. If you're confused about Israel, that Israel somehow perpetuated this upon themselves, you are incredibly confused. You have taken a conspiracy theory to its uttermost end. The people of Israel value their lives. They've experienced 2,500 years of diaspora, persecution, being driven from one place to the next. Every life is like a universe to the people of Israel. 
And the idea that they would kill their own for some bizarre conspiratorial purpose is just beyond the pale of anything that's decent. And it is, in fact, a blood label. Who, t who wants to tell us what a blood label is? Who wants, to, who wants to tell us what a blood label is? Not just during evil, medieval times, but from the early period of the diaspora and onwards, the nations will create these incredible conspiracies about the people of Israel. That they would make big nut matzah with blood in it. The blood of Gentiles. That's where it began. And there's been one bl blood libel after the next. And what these ten seven truthers are saying is nothing short of a blood libel. I hate to be in their shoes on the day of judgment. How can it be that people who initially began to recognize Israel and recognize the need for standing with Israel and, and, and recognize the need for Torah in their lives, how is it that they can come to such a place? Did I not warn you and tell you that these people will become incredibly anti-Semitic? I told you that. And so here we are. They're doing exactly what I told you they would do. They've turned against Israel in the most horrible way. This is a travesty, one that's worthy of the strongest rebukes. This happens when we lose track of who we are. No, we are called to be a, a servant to Israel, not to replace them, not to accuse them of blood labels, but to encourage them and to proclaim God's promises to them. And when we do that again in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's effectual. How many times, those of us that's been to Kidumim, that has been a vessel of that encouragement, how many times have you seen it? A show of hands. Have you witnessed this yourself? Yes. And what, what's the effect of it? It stirs faith in them. Faith in them that will not even come from their rabbis. It stirs faith in them that only the Holy Spirit can do, can bring about in them. You see, we have to know who we are. We have to value who we are. We are Mahaniam to Yaakov. We are the source of encouragement. We will give them the courage to go down to the Jabbok and face God. A difficult time is coming for Jacob, but he will overcome. How do we know this? Because the word is clear. God said it in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel. They will be my people and I will be their God. That comes after a difficult period. Yes, and it always does. When I became Messiah's, and he became mine's, it came as a result of a difficult period in my life. I went through the fire, and then I was born again. And I became his, and he became mine. That's my testimony. And that will be the ultimate testimony of all of Israel. They went through the fire. They were taken to the Jabbok. They stood. They fought against God. And then they became a prince with God. I'm going to read for you what God said to Israel through the prophet Hosea. And when I read this, I'm going to do my best to read it as clear as I could. I want you to listen to God's passion. I want you to hear his love in his words. His love for the people of Israel. In Hosea chapter 2, I'm going to read 14 to 24. Therefore, behold, I will allure Israel. What does the word allure mean? Draw her with a sense of romance, compassion. Bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Acre as a door of hope. 
And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. You see, God is looking back at Egypt. Didn't he do this with Jeremiah chapter 31? He looked back at Egypt. And he's looking back at Egypt here because he remembers his enthusiasm, his passion for Israel. And he's bringing them back to that place again. As in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me Ishi. What is Ishi? My husband. My husband. You will call me Ishi. You know, the word Ishi also means my only husband. My true husband. It's an amazing thing when I discovered that. Ishi, in Hebrew, my true beloved, my true husband. And will no longer be called Bali or Lord. For I will remove the names of the Baals from your mouth so that they will be, not, will be mentioned by their names no more. In that day, I will make a covenant for them, a ketubah for them. With the beast of the field, with the birds of the sky, with the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from their land, and I will make them lie down safely. This is what a husband does for his wife. I will betroll you to me forever. Yes, I will betroll you, to in, I will betroll you in righteousness and in justice, in love and kindness and in compassion. And I will betroll you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know your day, the Lord. You see, we, we, we received the witness of three prophets, three witnesses, who spoke effectively the same reality, that Israel, you were unfaithful at Mount Sinai. I will drive you out, but I'll bring you back. And I'll put my spirit within you. And you will obey my law. And you will be my wife. And I will be your husband. I will make a new ketubah with you. One that will not. This is the message. We have three witnesses bearing that, that message. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea. I can't think of three better witnesses. What I want us to take away from this tonight is that this is This is coming. I want to be present. I want to be a part of that wedding. You think it's possible, even remotely possible, that when Jesus spoke of the wedding feast and the inclusion of some and not others, that perhaps he was speaking of this very wedding and not his own? What do you think the chances are that Yeshua, on his mind, was this ultimate wedding? between Israel and the Holy One of Israel. I think so. I want to be dressed. I want to have the right garment on. What are the garments of the saints? Pure and clean. White. That's what I want. I see myself living out the rest of my life in obedience to God. Loving him with every fabric of my being. Refrain, refraining from unrighteousness. Rushing to the cross whenever I recognize sin in myself. I want to live out the rest of my life in this place because I want to be a part of that wedding. I want to stand with Yeshua as he officiates this wonderful wedding that God has planned for himself from time immemorial. When God brought the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, do you think that he had planned for that long in advance? What do you think? When he made that covenant with Abraham, do you think, do you suppose that that covenant was a major part of his plan of redemption? Of course it was. That covenant with Abraham would ultimately lead to Sinai that was supposed to be a wedding wasn't. That covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is leading to that new covenant. You see, we have a covenant. We have a ketubah with, with Yeshua. And we need to get rid of this idea that Israel has to receive our covenant because it's not for them. 
It's for us. God has a covenant for them. And don't tell me it's a blood covenant. Every covenant is paid for by blood. We have to come to terms with this. Otherwise, you'll stumble. That stronghold of replacement theology will grab you by the throat. Before long, you're an anti-Semite. If you don't deal with this rightly, before long, you're spewing blood labels. Yes, I could see it. If we do not come to terms with the reality, with the responsibility of who we are in Messiah, servants to Israel, to confirm to them God's promises that are appointed for them. It's that simple. We don't have to put them under our thumbs. We don't have to look down on them because they're stiff-necked Jews. We don't have to hold ourselves above them because we're just better. We have to hold them up. We have to get under them and lift them up. Encourage them with God's words. Be anointed with the Holy Spirit. And God will speak through you. It's the only way for it to happen. And so this video that we're going to be making in a couple more, two or three more weeks, I want you to really pray about how you're going to encourage the people of Israel. This is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to be an angel, to be a messenger, to let your words penetrate their hearts and encourage them. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, the, 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 whole, the whole reality of the coming of Messiah, of course, we're all excited about it. We're supposed to be excited about it. Yes, we're all excited about it. But even more so than being excited about his coming, I'm excited about the fact that he's going to use me in this great plan of redemption. He has an intention to use us, you, Fellowship Church, in this great plan of redemption. And we have to see it. The only way we can value it, the only way we can function in it, is to see it and fully embrace it. And just don't say, oh, that's something that that preacher talks about. I don't understand it. I don't really care. I'm just waiting for Jesus to come so I can get out of here. Many of us cop that attitude. Friends, brothers and sisters, we are the vessel of redemption. We are that vessel that God's going to work through. Why can't we believe that? Why can't we be excited about it? (laughs) <laughs> we should be incredibly excited about this. We live in days unlike any other time ever before. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, concerning these days, there's never been days like this or never will be days like this. But because of you, they elect. And because of Israel, they elect. These days will be shortened. God's not going to allow this, this beast, this, this world system to overcome humanity. He's not going to allow them to overcome you because of who you are. You are the elect. You are the ones that God has chosen to make a difference. You are the vessel of redemption. God will shorten these days because of you. Jesus meant that. He said it. We ought to believe it. So we have to be that vessel. The redemption depends on you. That you would surrender to him and yield yourself so fully that you would be that incredible servant to Israel and in doing so be a servant to the nations and to serve each other. The unity can't do without it. We're not going to get an inch ahead of where we ought to be without that unity. Put away all those silly things that causes you to stumble over each other. Just put them away. They're not that important to begin with. Most of them are attached to your pride. Just kill them, lay them down so that we can become that body of Messiah that God has ordained us to be, and ultimately that vessel, that that wonderful vessel that God intends us to be. 
I'm excited. These are exciting times. These are great times. Awesome times, but great, great times. Continue to pray for your brothers and sisters that are struggling with COVID. Continue to press forward in God's purpose. Surrender yourself more and more in worship, and God will be glorified. In your own lives, pursue intimacy with God. Pursue intimacy with him. The only way you will know intimacy as you come into worship is that you've been intimately worshiping him to begin with. Praise him with boldness. Praise him with, with your words, with your song, with, with, your, with your very soul. Praise him and worship him with your very being. God loves it. God loves you. Shabbat shalom.